Right. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for being patient. For those who came on at the very beginning, we're just waiting for everyone to join. So, uh, yes, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Please be aware that because this is a webinar style rather than a meeting, I cannot see you or hear you. Uh, so if you'd like to ask a question, which we very much encourage, please use the Q&A function. And um, my colleague, Abby Maiden, who is the um, volunteer coordinator for Northern Ireland will attempt to answer as many as possible during the session. However, we'll be also having a, a, a bit at the end for answering questions. Um, Abby will also put in the chat any extra inf information that is, is necessary. And uh, if you have any issues with Zoom, then you can put that in the chat function as well. Okay, so this is online training sort of about uh, introduction to the methodology of MPMS. Um, so you might be a registered volunteer, you might be thinking about becoming a registered volunteer, um, maybe you've actually been with us for a really long time but feel like you need a refresher, um, all, all, everyone's welcome. So um, yes, I hope I can hopefully make you feel more confident about it by the end. So just to give you an outline of where we're hoping to cover here today, uh, I'll give you a bit of background about the MPMS and why it was started. Then um, how you get started as a volunteer and leading on to the detailed methodology and how you carry out your surveys from the plot, plot selection and creation and doing the surveys on the ground. Uh, I will also detail the support and the help that you can get with all of these stages. Um, but basically the MPMS or the National Plant Monitoring Scheme is a UK wide citizen science habitat based plant monitoring scheme that covers the major freshwater and terrestrial semi-natural habitats. The MPMS provides an indication of changes in plant diversity and abundance across the UK's habitats through time and was designed to meet the need for a standardised approach to plant monitoring, which was identified as high priority within the Terrestrial Biodiversity Surveillance Strategy, which was published by the JNCC in 2008. The basis of the MPMS is that across the UK, monads, or simply one kilometre squares, have been randomly designated and then volunteers across the UK can allocate themselves one or more of these to survey twice a year, every year. So the National Plant Monitoring Scheme was designed and developed by the BSBI, CEH, JNCC and plant life as well. So JNCC is the public or uh, Joint Nature Conservation Committee, I should say, is the public body that advises the UK government and devolved administrations on UK wide and international nature conservation. They provide a shared scientific nature conservation service for the UK and are a mechanism for pooling resources to obtain evidence and advice on nature conservation and natural capital. So the UK Centre of Ecology and Hydrology is an independent, not-for-profit profit research institute carrying out environmental science across land, sea and air. And the BSBI, or the, Biologi uh, <laughs> the uh, Biological Society for Britain and Ireland, is a botanical society for anyone interested in the flora of Britain and Ireland and has been around since roughly 1836. Uh, recently, we also now have partners um, uh, DARA, which is the uh, Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs for Northern Ireland. And obviously Plant Life as well, which is who I'm employed by. So the MPMS provides an indication of changes in plant diversity and abundance across the UK's habitats through time, as we were saying. So in the UK, there are long standing schemes for monitoring populations of bats, birds, for example, with the British Bird Survey, there's the British Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, many of which maybe people are already members of and doing. Uh, but there wasn't a similar scheme for plants. And so with major changes taking a place across, uh, and declines in biodiversity across habitats being reported, for example, through habitat change, nutrient enrichment through nitrogen, climate change and so on, it became crucial to have a better understanding of plant populations. Uh, there was still and there is still and was a need for large scale um, coverage and a systematic approach. Otherwise, there's a potential to mask trends and weaken signals. So the four partners mentioned came together in 2012 to devise the scheme and the methodologies before a pilot was run in 2014. In 2015, the MPMS was launched. 
making 2021 the seventh year the scheme has run and data collected. Last year was a very pivotal year for the scheme as uh, after the sort of five years of data collection, they now had enough data to start looking at trends and indicators. I'm just making sure everything's okay. Thank you, Abby, for helping people out with any of the chat function there. Um, bear with me, my uh, slide thing seems to, there we go, just took a second for some reason. So as I've said, there was no robust survey for plants already established, and so there was a really a need for the scheme. Um, and this needed to include semi-natural habitats that were beyond the protected sites, so from you know, triple SIs, national parks, that sort of thing. So looking at what the data can tell us in the future, the scheme aims to provide habitat inventories and contribute to remote sensing. The aims also um, include investigating drivers of change using MPMS data, considering, for example, climate change which is obviously a big one at the moment, especially this year, because we've got COP26 happening in November. Um, habitat management, invasive species, pollution and eutrophication, coastal management, pests and pathogens, protected areas, animal plant interactions, for example. So in short, the, the, the scheme aims to establish national trends, monitor the impact of management, support and enable improved reporting against stakeholder objectives and work plans, and to add value and augment other data sets that exist. So this is just like a little uh, few facts and figures for you. So in total, there are 408 MPMS species that are recorded within the scheme, unless of course you're doing it at inventory level, in which case the sky's the limit. We've got 11 broad habitats. Uh, we've got five partners. We've got, well, we aim for five plots per square, but I'll get into more detail about that. And it doesn't always have to be five. And we have three levels of recording for, um, so what sort of uh, skill level you believe that you're at, and you can progress through those if you wish. Um, we've got two, you, two site visits each year and 28 fine habitats altogether. So this infographic was um, designed as part of celebrating the five years of the MPMS data. So some of the figures are now out of date. This was released last year. So for example, it says here we had 1,450 volunteers, but we actually now have more than 1,500 volunteers. Um, but it really highlights the dedication of our volunteers, this slide, because in five years, they've returned 876 monads with data and surveyed 3,977 3, individual plots, which is just incredible. So a huge thank you to all of our volunteers. Another um, document that came out last year, just at the beginning of lockdown, um, is our understanding the health of our habitats um, document. So that's all can be found on the website. So because monitoring the MPMS habitat plots twice a year, every year, this provides an unparalleled opportunity to track and understand the responses of plants to our changing environment. And it allows us to investigate the growing pressures on our environment from all of those reasons I said before, climate change, eutrophication, extreme weather, for example. And so after the fifth season, now having enough data, we produced this document, Understanding the Health of Our Habitats, released last year. Uh, and as I said, you can read the full document if you wish, but it's useful to sometimes see why the reasons why you're doing this and, the, and what your data is going towards and how it's helping. But another major um, achievement last year, um, which came at the end of last year, I believe it was October, was um, the MPMS um, basically contributed to one of the UK biodiversity indicators. Um, so during the end of last year, DEFRA and JNCC UK biodiversity indicators were published. And these provide an annual view of how a variety of groups of wildlife and other indicators of action of biodiversity conservation have fared across the UK in recent years. So as I said, 2020 was a real landmark year for MPMS volunteers because it marked the first ever contribution of MPMS data to a national biodiversity indicator. Specifically, MPMS data from four of the scheme's best surveyed broad habitats have been used to create a new indicator category C7 plants of the wider countryside. So the indicator is still classified as an experimental indicator and future work is expected. However, getting to that point in only six years of field surveys highlights the incredible ded dedication of MPMS volunteers in getting out into the countryside, establishing and surveying those plots, 
in order for us to understand changes to our environment. Therefore, now had it heading into it, our seventh year, there's huge potential for future, future analysis to show change in plant communities over time. Just released today, there is a little video and an infographic all about the indicator in order for you to better understand what it actually means and how you've contributed to that. So check that out on our YouTube channel and also our social media platforms. So as you can see on the map here with all of our squares, um, they're either orange, which means they have been allocated to a volunteer, or they're blue, which means they are unallocated. Um, so to date, we have 1,756 squares allocated, meaning some volunteers do take on more than one square. You may have seen the map like this on the website when looking for the request a square near me page or find a square near me, sorry. As you can see, there are still lots of blue ones, but particularly in the more remote areas. However, we are working on ways to encourage a greater uptake of squares in these areas through working with organisations such as the Mountain Training Association, Cairngorms National Park, Snowdonia Society, Lake District and Peak District National Parks, for example. But it's also worth mentioning at this point that if you have gone to look for a square only to find that they are all orange, meaning that they're already allocated, please don't be too disheartened. Squares are released fairly frequently by volunteers leaving the scheme or moving geographically. Sometimes volunteers are thrilled by the idea of sharing a square, so it's worth contacting us to see if that can be arranged, or simply they took it on but life has gotten in the way and now they want to release it, in which case if there's a particular square you're interested in and that's the case then we can certainly see if that can be arranged, in which case yeah, do contact us and we can sort it out. Uh, we also have plans to release more squares in areas where 70% or more of the squares have already been allocated. So to revisit, the aim is to provide reliable measures of change for individual species and species groups within semi-natural habitats and to use both positive and negative indicator species for each habitat. The species included in the scheme were chosen to be reliable indicators, species which are widespread and are relatively easy to ID. So sometimes we do get queried over some of the species that are listed as the indicator species within those habitat types. But it's worth remembering that a lot of time was spent deciding on, on these over a number of factors. So they are the ones that are going to best be used to reliably give us the data that we need um, to show change and what's happening. So I've, as I've said, the survey design needs to be straightforward, repeatable and achievable via volunteers. So to look into the sort of basics, once a surveyor has been randomly allocated uh, their one kilometre square, as in it's random in the sense that it, where it's put in the country, obviously you choose which square you want to take on. They then need to establish five plots, ideally three square and two linear. Plots should represent different NPMS habitats. Um, I'll go into more detail about that in a minute. Um, surveyors record the abundance of indicator species and any other background information and then this survey is carried out twice a year, once in late spring or early summer and then in late summer. So that's kind of an overview of it. So once a volunteer has requested and been allocated a square, they then receive a welcome pack with the survey guidance notes, a species ID guide, species and habitat lists, survey forms and a map of their one kilometre square. The ID book was specifically created for the scheme and is compact and concise, organised into flower colour. However, volunteers can and do supplement with their own ID books of choice. Uh, for example, uh, it might be that you've got Francis Rose, the Wildflower Guide, or I've got the Collins book. You can use whatever you want to, to supplement. Um, the guidance notes explains the details of the methodology and I would recommend that you read this thoroughly cover to cover if you can because it really does go into a lot of detail. The species lists show which species are to be recorded for each habitat depending on the surveyor level. You can also see the recording forms just tucked behind which once used in the field can be used for uploading the data onto the website. However, we do have a nifty app which I'll go into more detail about that that can be used directly in the field to record the data. It's worth noting that presently, if any of you are new to the scheme and have had your square approved um, recently within the last sort of three to four months, you would have likely only received a digital copy of these resources so far. This is just simply because I have not been able to be back in the office since the first week in January due, due to lockdown because um, our office is closed. 
But as soon as we can open the office again, I'll be sorting packs and posting, um, although I may be there for some time as there's a lot of new volunteers. So we always recommend um, that you visit your square to do a bit of a sort of reconnaissance to identify the NPMS habitats and establish plots and record your plot locations so they can be relocated. It's also worth checking that there aren't previously allocated plots on your square. So if you've taken on a square from somebody else, they might have already set up plots for you, in which case you might not even have to do any of that work. So we have currently advised that due to the current lockdown situation, a square reconnaissance should only really be done where it is local to you and would be part of a normal walk, et cetera, and you can maintain social distancing. We in no way want our volunteers to put themselves at any risk. Um, just do what feels comfortable with you. Obviously, keep in touch with what the COVID guidelines are. Things are changing, you know, um, and we've all got the sort of roadmap in, in, in our minds as well. Um, so, however, if you are following footpaths or lanes and using your OS map, then you can start to get a picture of your, what your square is like and who might own parts of it, for example. What's the access like and where our NPMS habitats um, are or how far they extend to. So once a square has been allocated, you then have time to look online at online maps. Maybe you've done some of your square recce already, and then you need to start considering the landowner permission side of things. So. So um, I'm currently working on a few ways um, where we can help with the landowner permission side of things, including a video on how to find out who might own a site and where to find the letter on the website, et cetera. But as you can see, we have a few tips, including um, using Google Maps, which is my personal favorite because it often includes um, business addresses or local addresses and things like that. Um, maybe your site or your plot is owned by the local council, or maybe it's a part of a national park or the National Trust or a wildlife trust even, in which case it's fairly easy to contact them and they'll probably be very understanding about you wanting to go there. Land registry is on the list and it is another option, but this may incur a cost and it's something that we're going to be looking into more detail as we go forward with the scheme. So on our website, we do have permission letters that can be downloaded and a thank you letter. So um, obviously, when we say keep the landowner information and landowner records, obviously, for reasons of GDPR, you don't want to sort of share these out. Uh, I mean, unless they're publicly available. So it was found already on Google Maps, for example. But definitely this whole part to do with getting permission from the landowner to survey your site can sometimes be a bit that either proves very tricky or can be a bit daunting. But do contact us if you've got any queries and um, we can certainly see where we can help. And if you just simply cannot find out who owns a site or you have not heard back despite numerous attempts and different ways of contacting them, then it's time maybe to think about a different plot location within your square. So the main points to consider when thinking about your plots are that we do suggest that you aim for three square five by five meter plots and two linear one by 25 meter plots. There are pre-selected plot locations recommended, which I'll go into more detail about that. Um, and it is recommended to use these to avoid site selection bias. I'll come on to the pre-selected plot plots in a minute. Surveys should really only be carried out in NPMS habitats and ideally each plot should be located in a different hab habitat. This is however difficult if A, your square has no apparent NPMS habitat on it, which I've seen lots of squares like that, or B, the whole square is only one NPMS habitat type. In these cases, firstly, the mapping data used to generate where NPMS habitat data is can be inaccurate and not give a true representation of what is on the ground. Therefore, don't assume that there, is, there isn't any, or this is why the, you know, the square recce is so useful as you can go and see on the ground. Plus with Google Maps, you can see where maybe there are little pockets of habitat that haven't been marked out. If you only have one NPMS habitat, for example, I've seen a lot of the squares that are just all heathland, then you'll really only be able to record in that habitat type. Um, but where what we are asking really is where possible, try and choose different habitats. On average, across all scheme monads, around four plots are surveyed per kilometre square. Therefore, do not panic if you can't five, find five suitable plots or even four. The reasons for all these apparent strict rules and regulations is that by following the guidance as well as you can, you aim to reduce bias and ensure that it's statistically robust, basically. 
So just to give you a brief overview of how the five plots are selected within the monads. So square maps provided to each volunteer will look a little bit like this. <clears throat> so the pre-selected numbered plot locations um, are randomised, but the one kilometre grid squares themselves are selected with a bias towards those with NPMS habitats. So the idea is, is that each of these one kilometre squares will hopefully have some NPMS habitat in it. They're not going to be put where there isn't any at all. Um, however, it might be that they just haven't got the, the colour coding marked on because, again, the mapping data that we have is inaccurate and we don't have it. So if possible, it's recommended that you use these numbered plot locations. As you can see, we've got them scattered um, amongst the, the whole of the grid square here. So as you can imagine, um, the reason for sort of asking you to use these pre-selected plots, because if we were able to choose our exact plot locations every time, we may very well end up choosing the rather nice patch of orchids in the corner of the grassland. And as lovely as this would be, if you scale that up nationally, this would give a misrepresentation of what is really happening in our habitats. If you're uh, maybe worried because your plot is so boring, we understand that this can be frustrating, but, but that is why we go on walks to nature reserves and maybe send in records to iRecords or our other local BSBI recorder. That's why we visit those wonderful places full of orchids to go and enjoy it. But these sometimes boring NPMS plots are how we are measuring the health of our habitats and it is so vitally important. So it may seem boring, but what you're doing is so important that, you know, and you can go and see the wonderful plants maybe that are nearby on your way to your plot or something. Equally, you might be one of the really lucky people that's got an amazing plot already that's full of great wildflowers, in which case it's an absolute joy anyway. Um, in the guidance notes, you will see that there's protocol A, which is regarding self-selecting plots. This can be done if there are reasons why you cannot use the numbered ones due to factors like safety, access, or where MPMS habitat um, is, for example. Protocol A suggests that you locate your plot in MPMS habitat, but more specifically, in an area of that habitat that matches the average or typical or representative of that area. So if you can imagine that you're, you're pre-selecting your own plot location and you're in, standing in a, in a lowland grassland site and you need to try and select where your plot's going to be, you want to pick where you think represents the majority of the habitat that you're standing in. So not the bit that's perhaps wetter than all the rest of it or the bit that's um, right by the gate, which has probably got some sort of new pioneer ephemeral species growing up through the gravel, etc. So you want to find the most representative part to select. So whilst you're on the site, you want to use fixed landmarks, um, if you can, to record the plot location and set up only temporary markers. So obviously the countryside code, we want to leave nothing behind. Then you record GPS, make a plot sketch with a written description, and it's useful to take annual photographs from the same point or angles. Linear plots can be along an arable field margin, hedgerow or watercourse. Woodland plots are larger at 10 by 10 metres. This plot setup is done on the website after a square recce and once done in the first year, it is then set up and ready to be simply surveyed twice every year each year. We do offer a lot of support and guidance on this stage um, with a YouTube video guiding people through it. That's the website bit. This year, we're also going to be expanding that with a mini series to aid people in the methodology and plot creation. So I'm hoping to, well, I'm in the process of recording how to actually set up your plot in the field and how, how to best go about that. So laying out your survey plots. So some linear plots are not straight, which is worth remembering. So obviously, if you're following the line of a watercourse, for example, don't worry that it bends and curves about or the line of a hedge, for example. But physically laying out your plots can seem a bit of a daunting task initially. However, there are a few tips to be aware of that will help if you, you learn them now. Regarding locating the numbered plots, this will simply be a case of looking at the map and maybe your OS map and aiming to be as close to that point as possible. Before setting off, it is really useful to have a length of cord or rope or several tied together with markers at each five metre length plus maybe bamboo canes or tent pegs to place in the corners of the square, which are to be removed afterwards, of course. 
So we recommend positioning your plot so that it is parallel to a fence, path, hedge, line or similar. So that or that orientation will help you when you reposition for the following survey visit. Um, then using the cord or rope, align the first side of the square, then using a clipboard or a book to create the right angle for the corner, then you can lay out the next side of the square, putting in your corner markers as you go. Once you have completed this part, um, you need to record the GPS location of the southwest corner of the plot. So if you imagine that you've got your rope with the five meter intervals marked on it, so each five meter length is one side of your square, uh, you're using your clipboard or your book to get the right angle for the corner so that you haven't got a weird squid shaped chair, square um, and you've set it all up. It's nicely angled with the path or the fence so that you'll remember which way it was facing last time. Use your compass if you have one or most of us these days use our phones which have got a compass on them um, to orientate yourself to the southwest corner of your plot and then using again one of the apps that you can get on your phone or if you have a GPS device make a note of the exact grid reference of that southwest corner. Um, it's also then worth taking a photo from this position and making a note that you were facing, which direction you were facing, and to make a quick plot sketch. So all of these are gonna help you for relocating your plot next time, but also for setting it up on the website. Just to go a little bit into linear plots. So most linear plots will be one by 25 meters for mostly arable field margins, standing and running water, rock outcrops, screes, road verges and hedgerows, for example. So ideally you want to want these linear plots to cover the part of the feature that intersects with an internal or a boundary grid line on your one kilometer square. So if you remember the square had lots of lines going across it. There are some numbered plot locations that are within the centers of those squares and there are some that are actually on the grid lines themselves. So those are to show you where ideally you would want to set up your linear features. So your plot should start at the point where the feature intersects with one of those grid lines and then from any direction from there. And it's worth using two markers to establish the one meter width and then using your cord or rope or a tape measure to mark out the 25 meters in length. It's obviously a lot of rope, so you might all have to be going purchasing a lot of rope. If you have GPS or um, a specific device or one on your phone, then you record uh, the start and the finishing grid references for a linear point, and then make sure you take photographs from sort of outside the plot showing the surroundings. If the linear feature is shorter than the 25 meter length, then just record the entirety of it and make a note of what length it actually is. There are not separate sections in the, sorry, there are separate sections in the guidance notes on linear features, particularly for vertical plots for rock outcrops, cliff bases and screes. So I won't go into detail on that, just read through your guidance notes for that. And again, there are further details about linear for arable field margins in the guidance notes regarding to which arable crops are not likely to be recorded like biofuel crops. So maybe those sort of areas wouldn't be included. And as you can see from the diagram on here, it's the naturally occurring field margin we're interested in. So not the sown areas that are there for bird food or wildflowers, for example. So that's why it tells you to go into the crop itself for a metre, because they are rare arable plants, for example, they'll be clinging onto the edge where the, the crop density is sort of lowest, um, rather than the bit, the strip that's been deliberately planted. And again, here for, for the water features, you can see that they want you to record from the, the water line in for a metre. So they, you're recording some of the marginal plants, but also some of the actual true aquatic species as well. So just to recap, you've done your square recce, you have your landowner permissions for the areas that you need it, and you've chosen which plots to use, and you have successfully located your chosen plot location, set them up, and recorded your GPS for each of them, and you've got a sketch map and a photo for each plot. So all of this can be done before the survey, maybe during another square recce, or you can do it as you're just about to start your first survey for your first visit. Either way, once you're back at the computer, you will need to set up your plots on the website first before you can start entering the plant data. Equally, this has to be done on the website before you can start recording in the field with the app. Um, whichever is easiest. So if you wanted to just do your general square recce, get your permissions and figuring out where your plots are gonna be roughly, 
And then when you go for your first actual site visit, that's when you set up your plots. But you just have to remember that as soon as you get back, you need to set up your plots on the computer before you can start entering your plant data for that first site visit. Um, but as you can see from the form, it has a section for your sketch map and the grid reference for each plot. So there is a handy step by step presentation on how to create plots on the website, um, as well as a YouTube video of our brilliant scientist at CEH demonstrating on the website himself. However, I will be adding to this by creating more helpful videos about these desk based processes. So I mentioned at the very beginning about choosing which level you wish to survey at. So each volunteer prior to recording the species in the field needs to decide which level they want to survey at. So all of the forms and the app can be used for any of the levels. So wildflower level, which means that there are, I think it's in total 212 easily, I mean, that's slightly subjective, identifiable species divided into lists applicable for the habitats about 10 to 15 species per habitat, say. Then there's indicator level, which is an expanded list of 408 species divided into groups applicable for habitats, including some species which are more challenging to identify. So maybe there's more grasses, sedges, ferns, etc. And there's approximately 30 species per habitat that you need to identify. And then there's the top level, which is inventory, designed for volunteers who are capable of recording all the vascular plant species that they find in a habitat. And it's worth remembering that this would include any that aren't in flower. So wildflower is the relatively simpler level in that there is a reduced list of species per habitat. So for example, if we think about dry deciduous woodland, which is a fine habitat, um, separated down from the broad habitat of just broadleaf woodland, so that has 20 species that need to be identified. So these are things like wild garlic, hazel, cleavers or sticky grass, galium, um, ivy, holly, etc. Whereas at indicator level, there's an expanded list of species to record, for example, 30. So that's an additional 10 in dry deciduous woodland with the additions of things like wood sedge, wood millet, wood speedwell, for example. Bit of a joke there on how many plants we can just add the word wood to and make it part of it. Oh, and wood speed well. Whereas inventory level is just recording literally all the species that are present within that plot, um, whether they're in flower or not. So just to go a little bit more into the habitats, for example. So there are 28 fine habitats um, sort of separated in within the 11 broad categories. So it's what we would love you to do is to ID the fine habitat if possible, but if not, just down to the broad habitat is fine. So 30 indicator species per habitat selected a range of positive and negative indicator species. So it's worth remembering that um, in the NPMS, we include species that are perhaps non-native, that are invasive, and it might seem strange to be recording those, but it's really important because we actually want to see the effects on them on the habitats. Uh, so species selected area based on the compromise between uh, species are selected because of their compromise between their reliability as positive or negative indicators, how widespread they are and the ease of the ID. So if you have very few indicator species, the information is still useful and still important. And you may want to record other species, um, but this information is still useful, but it won't be used to assess the change in habitat quality. So just going back to the habitats here, for example, so um, arable field margins is a broad, broad habitat category, which only separates into itself as a fine scale habitat. And there are 15 species to identify at wildflower and 30 at indicator level. I won't go into all of them because you can see them all there. And these are all detailed. Um, the habitats specifically are detailed within your guidance notes. And then the individual species lists are all separated out in the species list guide as well. We have now got going to be having webinars on every single one of the habitats this year. So do go and register for any that you think would be relevant to you for your plot or maybe somewhere in your square and that you want to learn a bit more about. Um, and one of the things that I'm trying to get our webinars to focus on, as well as individual species ID, is how you can decide whether you're in one of those fine scale habitats um, and, and how to tell the difference, particularly grassland, because that can be very difficult deciding whether you're in neutral damp grassland or neutral pastures and meadows, for example, because the two are quite similar. 
Um, so hopefully our training this year will help you to be able to make those decisions. So again, if you're feeling like you maybe need additional support and you're out in the field, so obviously you want to have your species guides with you. So we've got the one that we specifically designed um, for, for the scheme. Um, we've also got these additional ones that might be useful that anyone might already have or that you could purchase online. Um, but there are also other resources. So the BSBI website has got some amazing resources for learning for individual species ID. The Species Recovery Trust as well. There's so many online resources these days with little videos to help you. Um, but there are also actual physical training opportunities when we haven't got COVID in our lives. So the FSC um, Field Studies Council, they run a huge array of different um field ID type training opportunities. I've been on several myself and highly recommend them. Or maybe your local wildlife trusts are running some interesting um, ID sort of guides. So maybe just check those out. But again, at the moment, most of it's all online, of course. So this is just to go a little bit into detail about the survey forms themselves. So everyone, either whatever level you're recording at, all the survey forms will look the same. Um, but it's really, really important that you make sure that you tick which level you are surveying at. So whether it's wildflower indicator or inventory. Obviously, you've got simple things like you, we need the grid references um, of the plots, the plot number and the date. Obviously, it's very important when you're recording. Um, we've obviously got there for whether you're what broad habitat and then which fine habitat you've got. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about some of the awkward about the slope and the aspect and the management and the grazing and all of these things so it might seem a little daunting at first but because usually you're just choosing from an option it really isn't that taxing and then on the back of the form you've got the space for your plot sketch um, every time you go uh, maybe some management has completely changed the site or maybe a new stand of vegetation is dominating it's all sort of what could be potentially interesting and i'm going to be again putting more examples of of plot sketches that you can you know get an idea of what sort of thing we're after that would be useful for yourself but also for us um, and then obviously the bottom part of the form is actually filling out the species that are there to be recorded um, and i'm just going to go into a little bit about the domain scale because that can often sound a bit scary, but I promise you it's not. So it's using um, the relevant species list for each of the levels and the habitat, you search for your plot and see what species are present. So maybe starting in one corner and gradually moving out to the rest of the square. And remember, try not to trample the plants too much, mainly because it might find that you can't actually see what you're looking at. But regarding noting the domain scale, which sounds really scary, but it isn't, is a simple way of estimating the amount of ground each species takes up as a percentage of the total area of the plot. So don't forget the leaves. And it's, uh, so it's not just the space that the flowers are taking up. Don't forget all the leaves. And also remember, it's worth looking underneath the larger plants in case there are some hiding beneath as they do grow in layers. So it's worth here. So if you're doing a standard square plot that's five by five meters so one percent of that is going to be a 50 by 50 centimeter square so if you can kind of use your eyes to sort of gauge how many of those flowers would fit into that and then try and work out if it's one percent or more than one percent etc and then you can give the score accordingly and you will find that you will settle into that and you will be more confident at making those judgments um, as time goes on and you'll start to recognize differences within your plot each time you come and visit. So regarding things like aspect and slope, if the plot occurs on a slope, then record the main direction that the slope is facing from the normal compass range, for example, north or northeast, and then try to record the main slope angle. So flat is 0 to 5%, moderate is 6 to 30% and steep is over 30%. Management is sometimes very obvious and at other times not so much. So are there livestock, um, evidence of ditch clearance, hedge cutting, coppicing, etc. And if there is evidence of grazing, how intense is it? So high would be extremely short vegetation that looks like it's incredibly low cropped, no real stems of plants, lots of dung, etc. Moderate might be evidence of grazing, but the vegetation height is variable with a mix of taller and shorter areas. Low, which can be absolutely 
hardly any grazing or none at all. So the evidence of, is much reduced. Uh, most vegetation is tall, for example. And then the other thing we asked for is the Domin scale for bare soil, et cetera, which again is just to give you an estimate score for each based on, on what you can see. So these extra parts of the recording process are all ways that help with the data interpretation later on. So it might seem complex, but these are all ways that go into the data afterwards and that help can, can help work out exactly what's going on with your plots. So another one is the, um, the height classes for the different vegetation. So in a woodland, this measure is only for the ground and shrub layers only and not the final, the big canopy as such. And again, it's just an, based on an estimate of where you think the vegetation levels are. And then again, it's just looking at uh, what sort of equipment that you might want to have with you in the field. So um, you've obviously going to need your survey form or your app, if that's how you're going to do it. Your guidance notes, it's worth taking just in case you get um, a query that comes up about your plot and you're not sure, it probably answered in your notes, your species lists, your map, um, and possibly your OS map or something, clipboard and pencils, obvious, um, the tape measure and the string, again, it's for the, and the, all the plot paraphernalia, I should call it, um, your ID guides, your hand lens, um, your compass, or again, most phones have that, as well as the GPS device. Most phones have an app these days for that. And again, your phone has probably got a camera on it. So almost those, all of those, last, those second to last four are all one, really. And then just make sure that you're always considering health and safety as well. Talking of which, so this is obviously particularly important as we want you to stay safe above all else. So please do not survey large bodies of water alone, if possible. Uh, and obviously, don't try to get in to see that rare plant that is just out of reach. Um, we've all been tempted when you can't quite see what it is and you haven't got one of those fancy um, aquatic grappling hooks to get it. But it's just not worth risking your, your life for a plant. It really isn't. Um, make sure someone knows where you are and how long you're expected to take and maybe where your car is parked. Maybe have an arrangement with someone to let them know when you arrive on site and when you are leaving and then having a strategy in place for them to call you if they have not received notification from you after a set amount of time and what to do next. Call other emergency contacts, for example, or further help if they haven't heard from you. And obviously we're dealing with a pandemic at the moment, so obviously keep that in mind regarding social distancing, hand sanitizer, etc. And just, just trying to be aware. So in terms of once you've actually done your surveys and you've got this data sitting around, so what to do next? There is a lot of help on the website for data entry with step-by-step -step guides, YouTube videos, et cetera. But there are also, there's a specific webinar that we're going to be running on data entry. So please do register for that if you haven't already, so you can really learn how to do that part. Um, we also have data surgery set up so that you can book onto and you'll be given a slot or choose a slot where you can speak with me or Abby about your specific data queries. And you can always email me to or even a local mentor or on the Facebook support page as well. So there's lots and lots of help with this part. So there are two ways that you can submit your data. So there's via the website itself or the app. So as I mentioned before with the app, you just have to have set up your plots on the website first before you can start recording in the field. And if you're concerned about phone signal, then do not worry, as I believe the app is set up to work offline if needed. And then it sends the data once you get back within signal range. And just to show you a little bit about what happens with all of your data and how incredibly important it is. Um, so obviously we couldn't have come up with the um, biodiversity indicator without this data. We couldn't have been able to measure the change. I mean, it's literally policy makers, change makers, they're using this data that you're collecting to, you know, influence how to protect our habitats is in incredibly important. Um, and then ways to find support. So obviously, there's as much help as we possibly may be able to pack into your survey packs in terms of what's already there. But the website is an absolute wealth of resources. So um, we've under our resources page, we've got all these different documents that you can access or links or like individual links for habitat and species ID. We're obviously running all the online training 
um, and then there's the, the videos on our YouTube channel. But also, the, we, you know, if you wanted to contact us on any of our on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, somebody will be able to get back to you if you're posing a question. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, you won't feel like you're doing this on your own without any support. But equally, if you think that there's a way that you could benefit from additional support and that you don't think that we're covering it, then please do let us know as we're always trying to change the way that we do this. And obviously, since last year, having um, had to change the way that we do the training, we're still learning. So do, do let us know. Talking of which, so in, in normal non COVID years, we do set up face to face training all over the UK with local expert trainers who deliver a short bit of theory inside and then out in the field doing plot setup and recording. So we are planning on a handful of these later for this year. So watch this space. Obviously, normally we'd be running um, lots and lots of them all over the country straight from sort of April through to September. But um, all of them had to be cancelled last year. And this year we're just going to be a, able to cluster a few into maybe June, uh, July and August. But that might be it. And it might only be one for each area. So it might be limited numbers as well. But that's just unfortunately another one of the... Um, the effects of the pandemic on us, as you can see. <laughs> so we also have a lovely bunch of mentors that are well distributed across the UK, and they are always on help, um, uh, available to help with queries on methodology, data and identification of plant species, for example. And you can find your nearest mentor and their contact details on the website. We are also always on the lookout for new mentors too. So if you feel that you can share your skills and knowledge Maybe that is based more on the technical side of things like using the website and entering data than it is the plant side of it, then please do still consider a mentor role as this is an area a lot of volunteers feel they need extra help with at the beginning to get them started. And obviously, there's myself, so you can always just send an email or give me a call and we can always try our best to sort your problems out, no, no worries. So to find out more about the National Plant Monitoring Scheme, if you maybe don't know much about it yet, then obviously go to our website and you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And if you don't have any questions following this that I'm not going to be able to answer, then we'll obviously try to in an email. And just thanks so much for listening. And I'm now going to bring Abby um, back in the room, so to speak. And let's see if we've got any more questions outstanding. How are we doing, Abby? Hello, can you hear me okay? We can hear you, yeah. Just turning on my video there. That's all right. So how's it been? It looks like it's been very busy. Um, Some great questions coming in. Um, I've answered a lot of them via the chat as you've been speaking, but I've saved some that I thought would be yeah. very valuable for a lot of people. Okay. Um, so ones that are in the chat, I'll go with them first. Yeah. Um, so they're asking about how do the Scottish right to roam legislation fit into access for surveys in Scotland? That's a very good question. Um, it's funny that that's been asked, actually, because uh, I had a meeting um, with one of our chaps from Nature Scott the other day and this came up. And I guess I hadn't really thought too much about it and I didn't know about the legislation. So one of my plans is to actually investigate this a bit more because it turns out that for citizen science there isn't the restriction on access as there is in England and, and other areas so I, it might be that um, in the next newsletter I'm going to do a, a feature on that specifically and how those legislations apply to the scheme if you are recording in Scotland so I would like to think that it gives you a huge advantage <laughs> and that maybe you don't need to worry so much. But um, yeah, I will be investigating that and coming up with more information. Unless, Abby, do you know more about it specifically yourself? No. no so, okay, uh, that's fine. But watch this space because it's a question that came up literally last week. So uh, yes, I will be finding out for you. My God, saying you um, just out of courtesy to the landowner, it might be worth informing them that you're going on their land. Yeah, but in um, terms of them being able to deny you access, I'm not too sure on that. Yeah, I mean, the, the chap who I spoke to from Nature Scott, because his is some upland bog site, he just goes, surveys done, you know, um, apparently it's quite the norm. And, and in fact, the point where a lot of landowners in Scotland wouldn't come and query you like they would maybe in England if you were on their land because of the right to roam parts of it. So, yeah. Um, the next question is, um, 
do you ever use what three words to record corners of plots as it can be more accurate than GPS? Um, so with this one, um, we'd advise any way you want to accurately record your GPS, whether it's using Google Maps on your phone or any other navigation apps or what three words, um, you can use any of them or whatever you find easiest. Or if you do have a GPS, we're not saying go out and buy one, but if you do have one, you can use that as well. Um, yeah, that's a good question, well done. So then we are now, that's all the ones in the chat. So we're on okay. the question and answer session okay, here. Um, yeah. Are landowners aware of the initiative? So can't personally say for every landowner, but what we have been doing over the years is trying to publicize the National Plant Monitoring Scheme, um, do social media tweet meets, increase our social media presence, which we're also going to focus on more this year. Um, so there is a high chance landowners are aware of the initiative. Um, the NPMS has been broadcasted on radio stations, um, military magazines, um, your National Trust magazines as well has done pieces because they're a stakeholder. Um, so a lot of there is a chance a lot of the landowners will be aware of the initiative. Um, and if you are speaking to your landowner and they're not aware, feel free to share the website or any information you have. And if they're asking for the data, it's publicly accessible on the MBN Atlas. So you can go ahead and tell them what species they have in their land. And it'd be great to build up that interest of the landowners as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so Candy's just asking, sorry, I don't understand what you mean by the pre-selected plots. Is this something to do with the numbered points? Yes. So the, the coloured sections are to do with where there is MPMS habitat. Um, the numbered points are the, the plots that they recommend you choose from. So obviously there's more than five within each of the one kilometre squares. So these are just the ones that they suggest that you use. So that's what I mean by the pre-selected plots. Um, I think she's got another follow-up question. Asking about the southwest points, are they pre-selected plots? Are they the southwest points? What kind of oh, points yes. square? Yeah, so uh, the southwest reference I was making is when you've got your square plot, for example, um, you find out when you're in the southwest corner um, and then that's the, the the grid reference that you take. It's from that southwest corner of that five by five meter square, which is hopefully one of the numbered plot locations on your grid. But as I said, you can use protocol A, which is where you choose where to select your plot because you can't use one of the numbered ones on the map. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Um, the next question is regarding permissions. Do we need one to survey road vergers? That's a good question. I don't think you do, actually. Um, from my previous jobs, um, I don't think where I had to get a lot of landowner permissions for surveys, but road vergers, not necessarily. Um, but it could be one that I maybe follow up that specific question with our Plant Life Road Vergers team. Uh, they might know more about that. Um, but generally speaking, road verges, if they're small lanes within or outside villages, it's normally under the um, parish council's ordinance. Otherwise, it's county highways. And these days, you know, there'll be like an online form that you can just fill in with a query and just say, I'm thinking of doing this survey um, for this bit of this road verge. Is that OK? And, you know, that that will be job done, probably. Alternatively, you could contact your council's biodiversity officer because um, they might be interested one in the scheme, but also be able to give you further advice on that. And again, we know Sarah meant into health and safety, but road verges would be one of those areas that you need to pay particular attention to your own health and safety. Oh, if yes. in your car you have um, maybe one of those breakdown kits with the triangles, you could put one of them out. And again, just try not to survey or I'd actually say don't be serving any road verges around the bends or anything like that or blind corners. Just make sure it's on a fair straight bit of road. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of my squares is mostly in an NNR. Would the NNR typically have a more detailed map of fine habitats than the one we receive for the square? Um, so we're doing quite a lot of work with um, various NNRs, but um, it might be that they have more detailed information of where the habitats are. So you're more than welcome to start a communication with them. Um, but there's nothing like being on the ground. And often you find that some of these organizations don't actually have as up to date information as you would think. Um, but if it's a query because you're not sure where there is habitat, then definitely you can try and contact them and, and talk about that. 
if it's that you're unsure as to what fine habitat you're dealing with, then again, um, it might be that you just need to, to send us some information and we can help you work out which fine habitat is. But again, you could discuss it with them because they might know. Um, yeah, have you got anything to add to that, Abby? Do you just say the, um, the nature reserve, they, they're obviously managing this large site, so they might have more detailed information on the landowners as well. If um, obviously some nature reserves, the government won, and then other stakeholders such as National Trust, if your land's on a National Trust ground, it could be owned by private landowners. So you can contact them and they'll be able to put you in touch with the landowner just to make that a bit easier as well. Okay. Um, Candy's just asking about uh, the, <laughs> the domain scale part and how you work out if, so I, th I think I may have confused everyone, apologies for that about the looking at the one percent thing um abby do you want to see if you're better at explaining yeah. it um i don't know if i'm any better but i'll try the way i kind of look at it is um you have your square plot so what i would first do when i'm doing this is i record all the species i'm recording present if i'm doing inventory i'm doing every species or just the wildflowers present i'd write them all down and then i go back to each species and I imagine all of that flower or grass kind of clump together and then work out what percentage of that square that clump would be. Would it be 20? I normally kind of do 25, 50, 75, and then kind of go from there and kind of narrow it down to, okay, it's not 25, it's more like five or 10. Um, so that's how I would do it. I would try yeah. and imagine in my head, all of that species clumped together in one yeah. of the corners. Yeah, that's a good way of doing it. Um, it's kind of like just sort of spatial mapping visually in your head, like where you think, how much space do you think that plant's taking up? Um, but Candy does follow this up um, with questions about if there's any sort of video showing people collecting the data. And that is something we are going to be doing. Obviously, at the moment, I can't physically film it yet because there's not enough of anything flowering or out there just to look at, at the moment but that is definitely the plan and I'm also going to be running um, some Facebook live sessions out in the field doing some recording so that's something that we'll advertise near the time um, but hopefully yeah we're going to have a little bit more of a sort of actual visual guide on how to do these things as we go along so do stay tuned for things like that. And um, in the chat function further up in the talk there's the link to the YouTube channel so that's where everything will be posted. Yeah, at the moment it's a bit sparse, but um, yeah, it's being worked Watch on. Watch the space. Week. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, and a uh, local mentor. So again, I can't remember how many mentors we have in total, Abby. Do you remember how many there are roughly? Um, off the top of my head, I'd say around 50. Yeah, and they're spread out sort of across the UK and they're a volunteer themselves, but they've taken on sort of additional um, volunteer responsibilities. Um, to be able to be contacted, whether that be probably emails, the most usual way, or phone calls from other volunteers to support them with methodology queries. Maybe you've got some ID queries or, or you know, anything about the, the, the setup and things. And I know that obviously, again, in pre-COVID times, they've kind of joined up to local training events, things like that. So you can meet your local mentor um and they're just that they're, they're another way of getting support and help basically um in the chat i've put the link to the mpms directory of mentors brilliant thank you that's great um uh someone's asked about where do we get the app uh so the mpms app is available on android or on iphone and i believe their links are in the latest newsletter the one that came out for the winter newsletter um, I'm not sure if the links themselves are on the website as a standalone, but if you type in... I just put them in the chat now. Okay. The Google's coming through and I'll get the Apple one now. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Abby. Um, and, and we are trying to really encourage as many people as possible to, to get the app because it, it's obviously it's a great way to, to record in the field. Um, I did a piece um, for that winter yes, newsletter. You did, yeah. If you go on the NPMS website, there's a section where you can see all previous newsletters if you missed them. And it just kind of talks through how we were using the NPMS app and um, even just talks about things like if you've got no signal, it will successfully save your data and submit it once you have signal. The yeah. same as if your phone battery dies, it will still save it at that point. And then when you charge it up and have signal again, it will submit that data. Yeah. 
Um, Michael's just saying, I think referring to when he's saying the same months of each year if possible. So for example, if you did your first survey in May and then your second in August, I don't know, just as an example off the top of my head, then I guess in an ideal world, it would be great to do it May and August every year. However, you know, I think there has to be some realism here in people, you know, people's lives vary each year and what they're doing and things like that. So that's why we've literally just put it down as just two a year, um, one in early, uh, late spring, early summer and one in late summer. So it really doesn't have to be the same one uh, each time. If you're looking at it a purely scientific, scientific way for your plots, then that is something you can do if you want to. Um, it might be of particular interest for you to note um, if you go on the same date each time, what's different. Um, but in terms of the, the national scheme, I wouldn't fret too much about that. Um, There's a question here about how reliable are apps like Picture This. Um, so if you want to use apps along with your ID guides, that's absolutely fine. Um, the BSBI have recently published uh, an article where they reviewed all um, plant ID apps. Uh, Hamlin Jones wrote it. So they reviewed apps like Google Lens, Plant ID, Plant Net and Seek. And it kind of goes through all the different points and kind of talks you about pros and cons. So I'll put that article in the chat yeah, function now if you want to have a read. That's a great idea. Um, but I suppose with any of those apps, it does would rely heavily on how accurate, well, how the quality of your photo um, so I suppose the more detailed photo you can get, the more accurate these apps will tend to be. Yeah, exactly. Um, somebody's just asked about it's uh, a lot of farmland and about landowners and knocking on the doors. And definitely, if, if you're willing to, to do the knock on the door, do you own this piece of land? That's absolutely fine. If after being explained to what the NPMS is and then it doesn't allow any additional access to their land, you're not going to ruin their crops, etc. And they still don't want to give permission, then obviously <laughs> there's not a lot we can do at that stage. Um, it would be a case of um, looking for an alternative um, plot. And if, for example, that farmer who said no uh, owns the entire square, then we would perhaps look to actually leaving that, keeping that square out of the scheme temporarily because there's no access to it. Just the same as some sites were found to be located on MOD sites. And for example, they can't be accessed for safety reasons. So, yeah. Got a question um, that my map is 99% other habitat. The 1% is broadleaf woodland, which is not near a pre-selected um, plot. Um, so our suggestion for that would be you can survey that 1% and it doesn't matter in this situation that it's not near a pre-selected slot. Um, if you go to that broadleaf woodland and you can start setting plots up within that, um, because it's only a small area of your monad, what I would suggest is don't feel pressure to do five plots. Um, you could do two or three, depending on how big that woodland is. Or you could do um, two square in the woodland and try and find a linear feature yeah. in that plot as well, because there might be, you know, it's described as a habitat, but there might be some hedges Rose, yeah. that you could use as your linear plots yeah um, but for, that goes for anybody really don't feel pressured to do five plots if it's um due to limitation or habitat or due to time commitments um in fact the actual number average number of plots submitted for volunteers is four yeah um, for so various yeah, reasons yeah i would say with with that try and get you know depending on how big that one percent of woodland is you know get um, a plot or two out of that and then try and choose linear plots for the rest of the other habitat as it calls it um you know hedgerows uh, arable field margins road verge that sort of thing <clears throat> one of my indicator species is a grass i can identify it when it's in flower round survey but two but there are only leaves when i do the first survey what do i record it's a good question <laughs> um I would record if you can definitely be sure that those flowers are to do with that. Sorry, those leaves are to do with that flower. Then I would record it as the species present because um, currently we're not surveying kind of when the flowers are, when the species are in flower, the flower timings we're not really recording at the moment. Um, and when you're recording at inventory level, we ask to record everything that's in and not in flower. Um, so if you can be sure that those leaves, when you see them, are for that species, then I would record it as present in your first survey, even though it's not flowering to your second survey. But um, equally, I'd say if you are unsure, 
which grass is which when it's just in the leaf stage, then don't worry about not recording it in your first survey um, if you only can identify it in the second one. So it works both ways, really, I suppose. Uh, oh, we've got a few more coming in. <laughs> um, I'm just going to answer John's. What if you want to survey a site further than 30 miles away from your postcode if it's somewhere you regularly visit? Absolutely fine. So uh, if you're referring to the 30 mile limit when you're putting in into the finder square near me, don't put in any mileage for your postcode. Just return all squares and it will give you that map like you saw on my screen um, and then literally use the, the navigational tools to find the, you know, the area you're looking for. Um, and then select one over there. And if it's a, a, like a holiday destination, for example, then that's absolutely fine. Um, we do encourage people to do that if they wish to. Uh, how do I know if someone has surveyed my plot before? Am I right in thinking, Abby, that if you adopt a square, then it would be given, um, it would be given the, uh, when you go in to look at the square details, it would have all the plots already set up. Yep. That's yeah. correct. So you'd be able to see um, the existing plots. And we do ask if you would be able to resurvey those plots because um, it will give a like like comparison of that square year on year. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, asking for land ownership again, we would ask um, that you do just inform the landowner that you are kind of taking over that square. It shouldn't be a problem because obviously they've already allowed the previous person to survey, but just out of respect to let them know you're a different person surveying and it just keeps that good landowner volunteer relationship going which is as you can see really what the scheme relies on um sarah wilson says can you survey a wood that has been planted as a crop um i'm trying to think what wood do you mean a plantation woodland um sort of forestry commission style um not sure well, like willow plantations yeah i think willow is that would that come under the biofuels side of it i think and that we don't want to record that kind of no, thing I, I would agree with that um, um if it's a plantation woodland then again that's not one of our mpms habitats is it because we our broad habitats are broadleaf woodland and then the pine wood and juniper scrub i believe is supposed to be native pine wood is that correct yep yeah so um, if it's a, a oh, dense so then it's pine, I think is that yeah yes yeah. So if it's a dense pine plantation, then that's not one of our MPMS habitats, is it? No, if it's purely just pine. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it's a difficult one because obviously I know a lot of forestry commission sites that are heavily planted, heavily planted, but they've been on planted on um, ancient woodland sites. So actually, some of the ground floor is particularly interesting. Um, so it might be how old do you think the plantation is? Has it some of it been reclaimed with broadleaf native species that are sort of recolonizing naturally? Um, yeah, it's not. It's probably not always as cut and dry. If it's a very obvious young conifer, maybe like a Christmas tree plantation, then no, we wouldn't recommend recording it. If it's one that is more forest commission style, then maybe there could be a plot located there that's got broadleaf woodland parts to it. So yeah. The, um, oh, it's densely planted, but not very wide. Um, oh, it isn't densely planted, but not very wide. Hmm, I guess it's a difficult one to know on these ones without seeing them. Um, what's your thoughts, Abby? I'm thinking, just be clear, or yeah, because if it's not very wide, then the likelihood of it being representative of the habitat is slim because of edge effects. Well, also, um, sometimes a lot of um, strips of, of plant pine plantation are planted on farmland as sort of screens and, um, you know, shelter and things like that. And so they're not they're not a true characteristic of any of the MPMS habitats as such. They're just sort of filler trees. So maybe maybe try and avoid that if you can. Um, I think we're now a bit over time now. So if anyone's asked any extra que questions that we haven't got to, I really apologize. We will hopefully try and get them through. And um, 
if you know if you feel like you've got a question that you desperately want answered that we haven't got time for do just send us an email to um our support email gmail it's um <laughs> what is it mpms support at gmail.com and we'll try our best to to answer it there as well okay so if uh that's it for now we will bid you goodbye and thank you so much for listening and remember to check out our other webinars to register for as well if you're still interested that's great okay thank bye. you have a good day bye, bye.